hearing another series. Hallelujah. I think this is probably the third one we've done between me and Gemma. 12, 24, 36. Yes, 36. So we've done 36 weeks of steps um, since we started this ministry. And here we are at 12 again. So I just want to just pray, Lord, for every single one of us just before we open up, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you strengthen every single one of us in our in our program right now, Father God. I just pray, Lord, that you to help us and guide us to meet us wherever we are, that you strengthen each and every single one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So. It's healthy to admit that we're powerless over our addiction or our codependencies, whatever struggles that we might be having. We need to understand that we are not powerless in every area of our life. Of course, the power to do anything at all ultimately comes from our Lord Jesus and the power comes from God. But in many cases, we already have that power from him. But sometimes we just don't use it. Or else we give it away. And we give that power away to others sometimes. We allow, we allow ourselves to be controlled. We sometimes give other people the credit. And such was the case of uh, a king by the name of Zedekiah. He was the last king of Judah before its downfall to the Babylonians. And even though he was a king, he lived in such fear of the officials who supposedly served him that he often wimped out, gave in to their ways and said, I'm going to do it your way rather than mine. Yeah, a bit of a wimp. Even if he disagreed with what they said. So you imagine that. You're having a conversation with someone. You're the king. You disagree with what the person says, but you still say you're going to do it their way. Hmm. I've been there. Imagine that we've made decisions at times when we know that we shouldn't have made those decisions and said, we're going to carry them out anyway. I remember the classic one was when you'd, you'd know, <laughs> particularly in active addiction, let's bring it back to active addiction, where you go, uh, you'd be sitting down there, whatever it is, in a session, and you go to that person, and the one person you probably don't know says, I'll go and get them, and you give them your money, and you expect them to come back, and they never come back. And you think, why did I do that? Giving someone your power. King Zedekiah's life shows what happens when we do not distinguish between powerlessness and trusting God completely. And by giving away our power, we avoid the responsibility, we avoid the remedy that we need to be looking first and foremost to God and asking him in the words of the serenity prayer to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. That God grant us that ability and willingness to apply our hearts to the principles of scripture and the 12 steps. Let's go to Proverbs 24, verses 32 to 34. Proverbs Twenty-two, thirty-two to thirty-four. Okay, thirty-two to thirty-four. 
things. Thirty-two to thirty-four. Uh, Proverbs, Proverbs twenty-four, thirty-two to thirty-four. Proverbs twenty-four, thirty-two to thirty-four goes like this. Then, as I looked and thought about it, I learnt this lesson: a little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little fold of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. And the comments say, just as financial poverty comes to those who are lazy, emotional, in, impoverishment comes from those who neglect to work on themselves. As we work in our lives, weeding out destructive patterns and sowing the principles of recovery, we will reap a harvest of growth and recovery. Those of us who are lazy, however, will find our souls overgrown with weeds. Now we know that we can't earn salvation through works, but we also know that we have to work on ourselves. In order for us to change, we have to work these steps. We have to be accountable. We have to pray. We have to be in the word of God. We have to carry the message to others. If we sit on our laurels, like for instance, if my grass that's out there and I just leave it, it's just going to grow and get weedy and bushy and all over the place. And it ain't going to look too good. It ain't going to look too clever until I give it some attention. Maybe stream it. Maybe cut the grass. Maybe put some seeds down. Maybe do a little bit of pruning. Maybe a bit of weeding. It's the same with our recovery. The book of Proverbs teaches us great truths about ongoing lifestyle, particularly in our recovery. It brings us into a maturity in our lifelong use of the 12 steps and helps us to become people of wisdom. We hear about wisdom in the, in the serenity prayer, but we don't hear too much about it in any of the books in our literature, but here in the Bible, when Solomon asked God, he asked, when, when, when Solomon, Solomon said, said, I'm gonna ask God, you know, and, and God said, what do you want? He didn't say I need a new car, he didn't say I need a big house, he didn't say I need a wife, he, he said, I want wisdom. We say that in our serenity prayer all the time. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I believe that word, particularly in our 12 step program, is pretty undervalued and underlooked. But here we see we need to be wise. We need to have wisdom. We need to have discernment. We need to have understanding. We need to be able to discern. We need to be able to put boundaries in place. We need to be able to take our power back. It helps us become people of wisdom and good judgment. You know, we started in a process when we were seeking, we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. You know, when, when we looked at that question, most of us, if we're really honest in ourselves, really realized, and particularly this was a revelation for me, was I wasn't very good at making decisions. I thought I was. I wasn't. Proverbs teaches us that we have a part to play. We have to do our bit. 
We have to start living these principles in our lives. We must apply our hearts to what we read in the scripture. It's challenging. I mean, I read scripture daily, uh, you, 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 you know, and it's challenging. I come up short in every area. I get challenged by my own attitude of rebellion at times. My own attitude of conforming. And that's why it's important. There's sometimes when I see my leaders on my phone ringing, it's like, oh, what have I done? It's like, oh, oh. The problem teaches us that we have to play a part. We must also apply our hearts to what we read so we'll be able to learn from what we see. The Bible's showing us its basic instructions before leaving earth. It's showing us how to live life in this world, in this broken and fallen world. And one of the most challenging pieces, pieces of scripture that I had to come to terms with, it took many, many, many years. I had to deal with my love for the world. So I loved the world. I did. Loved everything about it. When we look at scripture, it says, those of you who love the world don't love me. How challenging is that? And that's why it says we need to put off those things. And let's look at it. Let's look at those things because it's really important that we look at, uh, I'm going to go to a little bit of passage of scripture here. In Isaiah, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message. A life set free from addiction by the Lord is a beautiful sight. When we practice these principles and share our experience, people will see the glory of God in our lives and gain hope. We know from experience the depths of suffering, affliction and brokenness. We know the pain of being enslaved to our passions and blinded by our denial. We have endured our seasons of grieving and we can relate those struggles to be free. We also know there's more to life than, bonding, than bondage. We also know there's more to life than bondage in Christ. We are healing from and we are gaining freedom, clarity, mercy, and joy. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he had a mission, which was expressed in these words The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. In fact, I'm just going to. Just gonna show it here because it's um it's one of them ones that we need to have a look at. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Let's share it. Should I want it? There we go. We should be able to see it. The spirit, oops. That the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed us to proclaim the good news to the poor. And he has sent you, Fusia. He sent you, Sarah Lou. It said, you, Chloe, 
He sent you, Gemma, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to give recovery of the sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful, isn't it? That that's what the Lord is doing. He's anointed and appointed you on this mission, on this minefield. When we look at that, the Lord's favours come to all who mourn. Mourn our own life. He says he will give us a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing, a festival of praise instead of despair. The mission has been passed on to us. And some people talk about preaching the gospel but they may alienate those who need the good news the most. So we need to be careful. My, my wife's always saying to me, um, you know, stop shouting all that nonsense. <laughs> she says, no, just <laughs> shut up sometimes. <laughs> Particularly on the screen, the they think you're a lunatic. <laughs> so, you know, so I took a different approach the other week and, you know, I balanced it all out and it was just amazing. So you don't always have to go out there and, you know, ram the gospel down people's mouths. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it's just a simple approach of, listen, I just want to pray for you. And that will open up a conversation. So, yeah, it's really powerful this morning that we can see that our stories, that each one of us has a valuable story, each one of us, to tell that we may be shy, we might feel awkward at times about speaking, we may feel that we ain't even got nothing to share. We might think that, you know, our walk ain't even good enough. We may struggle to get beyond the shame of our past experiences. But our recovery stories and where God has taken us, I can tell you right now, is going to help someone. Jesus left us with a vital task. Go into all the world and preach the good news of salvation. Preach the good news of what God has done in your life. That once you was lost and I was, I was found. I was singing Amazing Grace with my preaching yesterday and every single person understood what that Amazing Grace was. That once I was lost and now I'm found. And those that were walking by, if they had any position or disposition in their hearts, they would have known that that would have touched them. Paul traveled the world telling everyone of his conversion. He ended up in chains, but his spirit was free. He presented his defense before kings. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian? So quickly, Paul required. Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as me. This is when he's preaching to King Agrippa. Within each personal journey from bondage to freedom, it's a micronism of the gospel. When people hear our stories, even if they seem trivial, we are offering them a chance of escape, a chance to escape their own chains and begin their own recovery. So I'm not going to bang on too much this morning. I just want us to simply understand that there were three parts to step 12. The affirmation of our spiritual awakening, carrying the message of that awakening, and practicing these principles that we've learned for our entire life. Working diligently on the first 11 steps that we have acquired a healthier view of ourselves, a healthier view of others, and of course, we should be in a relationship with him, Jesus. And this has enabled us to live free from the bondage of addiction on a more consistent and contented basis. 
even if we previously believed in God, we have achieved a greater level of surrender through this process. We've learned more about humility. We've learned more about serenity than we can ever manage, allowing the Lord Jesus to free us from the burdens and the compulsions of addiction. So, Father Lord, I just want to pray this morning as we recognize that we need to be practicing these principles in all our affairs. Practicing these principles involves continual application of all 12 steps to our life circumstances. We must recognize our powerlessness and unmanageability of our own lives. We must continue to ask God to remove our insanity and restore our wholeness. We must continue to surrender to God daily and let go of control. We must continue to make honest inventory of ourselves, not others, and share our confessions with our brothers and sisters. We seek help so that God can cleanse us and fill us with new strength, six and seven. We recognize the harm we've caused to others and take action to heal our damaged relationships, eight and nine. Ten, we preserve in the training of our 12 steps in our daily lives. Eleven, we have conscious contact. We have a conscious contact with him. We have a conscious contact daily with that power. Daily. That we give away what we've gained freely. Give it away. We only keep what we have by giving it away. What we've gained in our journey. Remaining in recovery is similar to what Jesus said to his disciples. In John 15, 5, he says, those of you who remain in me and I in you will produce much fruit. Hallelujah. If we remain in Christ, he will produce the fruit in us. He will show us how to carry this out. He will show us how to live by these spiritual principles. He will show us how to overcome sin and our defects in our daily walk. He will show us how to empower others if we live and abide in him. Because it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, try to carry this message to others and the power, the power comes from him. Let's not make the mistake that the power comes from us because it doesn't. We can't do this continual journey unless we are, remain and abide in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must be careful of a few enemies. Complacency being one. Property prestige being another. Pride being another. We must be careful that these things are there still to trip us up along our way. And I'm going to find in Jude where it's in uh, Peter. Is it Peter? Yeah, Peter 3 1. Peter 3 1. Let's be only one second. He's with us. He's continuing to guide us. He will lead us as we maintain and persist in our recovery that the Lord God has shown us. He's shown us that new way of life, that new way of thinking. 
but we need to be careful that as we learn through these steps, that God shows us what our personal character is like. And when we look at 2 Timothy 3, 1, we know before we came to Christ that we were lovers of our own selves, self-centered, conceited, egotistical, greedy, covetous, boasters, proud, arrogant, haughty, haughty, overbearing, blasphemers, profane, abusive, contemptuous, foul-mouthed, insulting, unthankful, ungrateful, unholy, without natural affection, hard-hearted, callous, inconsistent, lovers of pleasure. This is where we come from. So we mustn't forget. We mustn't forget where we come from. It's very important that we don't forget where we come from, that we hang on in there, that Lord give us your power to keep on working the program, even when it seems tedious. Nothing pays off like perseverance. We need that spiritual principle to keep moving on and pushing on. Recovery is like writing and like salvation. It's impossible without endurance. For our salvation and for our recovery, we need endurance and we need perseverance. We need to keep going, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, even when we feel like times like giving up. Because not everything is enjoyable. A lot of recovery in Christ is plain old hard work. It's craft. It's things. This can happen. We need to grit our teeth sometimes, clench our fists, put that armour on and keep moving forward, keep moving in our recovery so that we continue to overcome. Hanging in there may not be fun for everyone. It may not be easy, but we know one thing. It's worthwhile. It's worthwhile. Father Lord, today, that each one of us we know has a valuable story. Let's go and tell it. As we get further along in recovery, the memory of how bad our lives really were may, may, may begin to fade. Do we vividly remember what we once were like? Can we humbly recall those dark emotions and those dark times? When we take the message of recovery to others, we must never forget where we come from and how we got where we are. I'm here to tell you, it was God that was with us all the time, bringing us through. When God our Saviour revealed his kindness and love, the acts of providence, he saved us not because of our righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy and his grace that has washed away our sins. He's given us a new life, a new heart, a new spirit, a new birth through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we share our message, let us never forget the following truths. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you today, we thank you for having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, that we can carry this message to others. Peter pointed out that have you've had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. It talks about their immorality, their lust, their festing, their drunkenness, their wine parties, and of course, our using. That we were former friends of these things. 
Jesus said, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. But he said, the highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for many who choose the way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult. And in Matthew 7, it says, only a few find it. Which is sad. Our message won't be accepted by everyone. The people on the highway won't eagerly accept. They may restrict themselves to the clearly defined steps on the road to recovery. But for those who do listen to our stories, it could be the difference between life and death for them. And that's how powerful this message is. That's how powerful of the message that we carry. There only needs one. Amen. I'm not going to open a meeting. If you want to share back, that's fine. If you want to tell us where you're at, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. We shall just brim on with our day and close the meeting.